Well, good evening, and we want to welcome you to our Bible study for today on Tuesday, August the 11th. We're still in that crummy year of 2020. I'm afraid I can't transport us into the future yet. That's not in my capability. But let's pray for you today, and let's pray for God's blessing to see you through this challenging time. Heavenly Father, um, we just pray that you would continue to bless the people of our congregation, all those who are watching here today. We ask you to reach down and touch and bless and heal this world in our time of frustration Heal our hearts, heal our bodies. We pray you also heal this country because we are continue to be divided. And God, we ask that your church would be a source of that love and that peace and that reconciliation. We can't do that if we're colluding or aligning ourselves with a political party and that becomes more important than a relationship with Christ. So we ask you to help us to put these things aside and be a source of reason and a source of love in this country. May your healing peace be made known, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you again for joining us. Just an announcement. If you haven't heard the announcement yet, this Sunday, that will be August the 16th, 2020, we will resume in-person worship at 10 a.m. It will be outdoors on the front lawn. We ask you please bring a chair and please wear a mask. We are asking you to be respectful of those who are around you, and that's how we are going to do it in our congregation. It's how we roll. I don't care what your politics are. I don't care whether you think it's a silly thing or not. We are going to respect the members of our congregation and protect one another. And so we are asking you to do that. So please wear your mask. Please bring a chair. We are going to sit on the lawn. We're going to worship God. It's going to be a wonderful service. Now, if you're one of those that just isn't quite ready to resume in-person worship, never fear. We will still have Holy Communion available for you if you would like to come to the altar separate from that service. That's between 9 and 11 a.m. Now, there will be a service going on between 10 and 10.30, so just be patient. Between 10 and 10.30, come maybe before 10 o'clock, maybe after 10.30, then you're welcome to come to the altar. We'll make sure that you receive and you and your family receive communion. If you are uncomfortable with even that, it's okay. We will still do our worship service online on our YouTube channel for, for Holy Trinity. So we, have, we will not forsake you. We will continue to provide that for you, and we hope it continues to be a blessing. Okay, let's get on. Let's take a look at the, uh, uh, the reading from the book of Genesis for today. And just a little bit of background. We have been jumping a little bit further ahead because reading this continuous reading of the book of Genesis, it depends upon you reading parts of the book of Genesis every day, seven days a week. So that's why we kind of get a, a story here and a story here, and we seem to jump ahead in time. Again, wish we could do that to 2021. Would that be fabulous? But we can't, but we are in the Bible. And so last week we looked at Jacob, and we looked at him wrestling with God and so forth as he was going back to try to reconcile his relationship with his brother Esau. And of course that did happen. We kind of missed that reconciliation story. Um, we come to this lesson where Jacob finally brings his wives and his, his sons. Now Jacob, <laughs> Jacob was a polygamist and I'm not going to lie to you. The Bible doesn't directly condemn polygamy. And you might say, boy, that's odd. But it does in its own way. The Bible through story shows us how devastating polygamy is on human relationships, on relationships between siblings, on the, between the spouses, the heartaches that it brings. So the Bible is a Bible story. It shows us what's wrong with polygamy. It doesn't here tell us, it's wrong, you shouldn't do it. That's not one of the rules. It shows you how stupid it is, and you're going to see how dumb polygamy is and why the Jews finally rejected it as a, um, as a means of, uh, of, uh, of marriage, that uh, they became monogamous, as, as much of the world has. So Jacob had two wives, and he had many concubines. Basically, the concubines were the servants of his wives. Uh, he had two real wives, Rachel and Leah. Leah was the older sister, Rachel the younger one. We are told in the Bible that, that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. And he kind of despised Leah. Now, Leah, Rachel had two sons, okay? All the other women that he was with had a total of ten. Leah was prolific, 
But the problem with Rachel is Rachel in the birth of her second son, she died in childbirth. So she had two sons, Joseph, and she also had a second son, Benjamin. It was in the birth to Benjamin that she died. As I mentioned to you, the Bible is not sponsoring polygamy, but we're going to see in just a moment the type of division that occurs in a family because of this type of relationship. Now, the very first thing we run into with Jacob, Jacob is reconciled with his brother. We start into Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land with his, where his father, Isaac, had stayed, the land of Canaan. Well, what's Canaan? Canaan land, maybe you've sung that in some of our hymns, and you've heard that phrase, and you wonder, what is Canaan? What's Canaan land? Canaan land, Canaan is Israel. That's who occupied Canaan before it became Israel. Now, I don't want to go into too much depth with this, but the Jews were Canaanites. I know we often think of them as two different groups, the Jews and the Canaanites, and the Jews were kind of a sub culture within the Canaanite culture. So they shared a common culture. They were genetic related. So they were family members with the Canaanites. Eventually, probably at the time of David, David was the king, the, the second king of Israel, was able to unite all of Israel, all of Canaan land. And it, 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 there's little doubt in my mind that all of the Canaanites came to get together under this banner of being Israelites or Israel, Israelites. And so that's kind of how it happened. So Canaanite, the name Canaanite then became synonymous with something that was bad. But the Jews, make no mistake, they were Canaanites. All right, they were a particular brand of Canaanites. So let's go on. So they were settled in the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family and his line. Joseph, again, his son, first son by his beloved wife, Rachel, his son, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. These were two of his maidservants. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Joseph is a tattletale! Okay? I'm going to tell you something. I know when you hear the word Joseph, you think of Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, don't you? Now, I'd sing some of that for you, but... We're not going to oppress you with that right now. It's a great musical. It's a lot of fun. We often think of Joseph, oh, he was that godly guy. No, Joseph was a tattletale. In fact, my title for today's lesson is this. Joseph, the vain, arrogant, tattletaling, crybaby. That's who Joseph was. we got to give him some room to grow, okay? That's kind of the point. This is what the Bible is trying to show us. So don't look at Joseph and say, oh, he's such a godly man. He's not a godly man. He's a jerk. Okay? He's a punk. He's a tattletale. He's telling on his brothers. Oh, daddy, you should see what my brothers did. Oh, daddy, you know what, Zil you know what this person did? Oh, you know what this guy did? Oh, daddy, what are you going to do? Don't you hate a brother like that? Wouldn't you want to string, strangle him up and wring his neck? This is what Joseph is. He's a vain, arrogant, tattletaling crybaby. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons. Israel, wait a minute. Who's Israel? You know, you think of Israel again as the land. At this point, if you remember the last lesson we read, Jacob means the name heel grasper. But in last week's lesson, we saw Jacob wrestling with God. God renames Jacob and calls him Israel, the one who wrestles with God and won. That's who Jacob becomes. So he now becomes the eponymous uh, ancestor of the nation of Israel. They now call themselves after Jacob, after Israel. So whenever you see Jacob, Israel... Oftentimes, it's referring to this individual, not the country. So, let's go on. So, Israel loved Joseph more than any of other sons. Uh, do you see a problem here? What happened? He made it abundantly clear that his son Joseph was his faves. My baby. I love Joseph. He's so cute. And so, because he had born, 
been born into his old age, and he made an ornate robe. You're used to, again, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat, the coat of many colors. I think this is probably a better translation, an ornate robe. It was an ornate robe. It was very expensive. Now, when his brothers saw it, that their tattletaling brother, the punk that he was, that their father loved him more than any of them, because none of them got ornate robes, they hated him. They could not speak a kind word of him. Can you blame them? I mean, seriously. If this is your brother, and your father makes a plain that he loves your brother or your sister more than he loves you, don't you get a little jealous and don't you get a little bit angry? I don't blame them. Because in addition, Joseph took advantage of this. He was a punk. Make no mistake. You should not like this man. Not at this point. You will later, but not now. He's got to go through a big change. See, this is what the Bible does. It takes really faulty, frail people and shows how awful they are. Jacob was a horrible person, but God transformed his life. He still did some stupid things, as you can see, by loving his one son more than the others. But he's a changed man. Joseph, he's a punk. We're going to see in the lessons to come how God changes him. So he's got to start out way down here before God can bring him up here. So let's go on. Joseph had a dream. Oh, Joseph. When it was, he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaves out of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and they bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to rule over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of this. Okay, so Joseph gets this ornate coat, and now he's got this dream that he's going to be the boss. So then he had another dream, and he told his brothers, Listen, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as brothers, his father rebuked him. At least his father finally took him aside, okay? His father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So his father is trying to control his brothers and trying to keep them from killing him. You know, it's interesting because this lesson is kind of censored from the continuous readings. This part of the lesson, I'm not sure why. I think they want to make sure that you sympathize with Joseph. Don't sympathize with Joseph. What did I say again? He's a, say it with me, a punk. He's a jerk. Even his dad is shocked at the temerity, the vain arrogance of his son Joseph. <laughs> well, let's take a look what happens. Now, Joseph's brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said, again, Israel, Jacob, Israel said to Joseph, can I just stop here a minute? Why isn't Joseph with his brothers? Oh, because he's so full of himself that he doesn't think he needs to work. He's doing his nails. He's got an appointment with his agent. I don't know what he's doing because after all, he's getting fitted for his coat. He's going to be the roller. This is supposed to give you that impression. Joseph should have been there. He was old enough. He was 17. He was old enough to be there with his brothers taking responsibility for the flocks. But why wasn't he? Oh, because he's an arrogant punk. All right. As you know, your brother's grazing the flocks near Shechem, Joseph said to, uh, uh, Jacob said to Joseph. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. Oh, he's so obedient to daddy. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. He's going to go and tattletale on them again. Oh, I can't wait to go and tell my dad what they're doing now and how they're messing around and goofing off. So he was sent off to the Valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me they were grazing with their flocks? Oh, they moved on from here, the man said. I heard him say, let's go to Dotham. 
you know, and this would be common. Obviously, you don't want to overgraze the land. You want to leave some so it grows back. Or maybe it's just not fruitful right now. Or maybe there wasn't sufficient rain for the grass to grow. Whatever the case might be. So they went to Dauphin. Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dauphin. But they saw him a distance before he reached them. And they plotted to kill him. <laughs> Again, can you blame them? I, murder's a bad thing. Okay? Murder. Bad. All right? Joseph's brothers don't come off looking very good here either. It's definitely an overreaction. But it shows you what happens when you have a family that's divided. Divided by polygamy, multiple wives, jealous brothers, a father who loves one brother over another. Do you see how the Bible is being critical of this type of behavior? So, so the brothers, <laughs> we're going to kill them. Yeah. All right, here comes a dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him. Let's throw him in one of the cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Hey, this is actually a pretty good plan. Okay. Then we'll see what becomes of dreams. You know, there's no cops back then. They're not going to go do an investigation. They're throwing a cistern. What's a cistern? Cistern is, can be natural. It can be human made. Uh, in fact, the early Christians would actually make cisterns in which they stored water so that in the dry season they could actually do their baptisms. Isn't that fantastic? And also, again, make sure that the poor had ample water to drink. So you could have human-made cisterns. You also had natural cisterns where water would naturally pool and would stay there for a while. This was likely something more natural. A natural cistern. So they were, it was empty, so it was a dry season. They were going to kill him and throw him in there, and nobody would be any the wiser, right? Well, Reuben heard this, and he tried to rescue them from her. And so at least one brother's good. Reuben. Reuben's a good guy. At least in this part of the story. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay on a hand on him. Reuben said this so that he might rescue him and take him back to his father. He was going to help him escape. But Reuben was overruled. But you, you, you probably are sitting here wondering, well, why wasn't Reuben more courageous? Do you see how these brothers are willing to kill one of their own? Do you think if Reuben kind of spoke up and said, I think this is wrong, they might have killed him as well too. So he's doing the best he can in a chaotic situation where there's a great deal of division, animosity, and hatred. Not totally unjustified, because remember, Joseph is a punk. He's a jerk. Doesn't deserve this, but he is a jerk. All right. So Reuben said this so he might rescue him, take him back to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his ornate robe that he was wearing. They took him and they threw him into a cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Again, probably a dry season. They took him and threw him in, and uh, uh, as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Oh, now this is rich. Who were the Ishmaelites? Ish Ishmael, 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 Ishmael. Where have you heard that? Ishmael, Ishmael. Ishmael, do you remember? He had a brother. Hmm. His dad was Abraham. Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael to a servant. Isaac he had to his wife, Sarah. Again, this created division because multiple wives or concubines is never a good thing. But the Bible shows us the type of division. So the Ishmaelites were, uh, again, their grandfathers... Cousins, or I should say, yeah, family, cut through his grandfather's nieces and nephews, I should say. So they were cousins. Okay, they were cousins with the Ishmaelites, Ishmaelites, second cousins by this point, I guess. So they, uh, so they looked at, the, so here we are, the Ishmaelites, and they come from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. They were traders. They are going to make some money. Yeah, Judas said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? <laughs> this boy is thinking, right? What does he say? Come, let's sell him. He's, he's a capitalist, for goodness sakes. Oh, my goodness. Judah is. Come, 
Let's sell them him to the Ishmaelites. Not lay our hands on him after all. He is our brother, our own flesh. Oh, we're not going to kill him. We're just going to sell him into slavery. That's so much better. Okay. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. By the way, in case you're wondering, when uh, Judas uh, sold, sold out Jesus, it was for 30 silver pieces. So I guess Jesus was, you know, that's inflation, I guess, over a thousand years or so, 1,500 years. At any rate, so for 20 shekels of silver, they sold him to the Ishmaelites, because obviously they're going to get more for a young man, and then they took him and sold him into slavery to Egypt. Okay, so what do we learn from this lesson? Well, I think the first thing we learn, because it's demonstrated to us, polygamy, bad, creates division. Hey, the other thing that's bad that creates division and creates strain on a family? Oh, loving one child more than another, treating them. You know, you're going to treat your kids differently if you have multiple kids, but you need to make sure that you love them equally. Now, I'm going to stop here for a second, because this lesson does deal with slavery. There are some of our brothers and sisters who don't get this following phrase. They get really offended when they hear it. And that's this phrase, black lives matter. Right? Well, all lives matter. Well, it is true. All lives matter, and it's true. But we're talking family. Black people are our family. Okay, they are our family. We whites are Joseph. We've had everything laid out for us. We are the ones dressed in the ornate uh, cloak, okay? Now I know, that doesn't mean everything's perfect in your life, but there are certainly advantages that we've had in this country as a result of the color of our skin. Not always easy, that doesn't mean that you didn't have some hard days, but there are certain things that are harder for people because they are black, because of the color of their skin. Now, if you've got a younger sibling and they're constantly ignored, and the one brother is loved more than the rest, what happens? The younger brother at some point yells out, pay attention to me! Stop! Oh, and you know what the older brother then says? Hey, get back in your place. All of us matter just as much. No. Because the younger brother might have a point. He might have been ignored. He is, might be justifiably upset. So he's crying out for help. Pay attention to me. Oh, come on. All of our lives are just as important. Well, they're not because the Father is loving you more than me. Yes, all lives matter. But we're ignoring our younger sibling. So our younger sibling is crying out for help. Pay attention to me. What happens when we don't pay attention to the younger sibling that's hurting these are the 11 younger brothers of Joseph, the arrogant twit. Well, they get upset. In this case, they sell him into slavery. Well, maybe he didn't deserve that. But you can't blame the 11 younger brothers for being a little ticked off with Jacob. Pay attention to me. That's what they're asking. And their father never paid attention to them and gave them the love that they deserved. This is what's going on in our country, people. Come on, let's grow up. All right, let's grow up. There are folks, our brothers and sisters, who are black. I'm not calling them cousins. They're not cousins. They're our brothers and sisters, folks. We're one family. It's kind of stupid that we, we treat a family member differently because of the color of their skin, but we do. Okay? Their lives matter. Yes, all lives matter. True. But we've been ignoring our brothers and sisters because we have favorites. We have faves. When you have faves, we create division and heartache and pain. This is what was going on in this lesson. Boy, this is really contemporary. This is what's going on today. Arrogance, self-importance, the crybaby Joseph. He was no innocent in this. So we sit here and we say, oh, look at the violence that's going on. Well, we created some of the circumstances. We're not completely innocent here, people. I know 
you are maybe not personally responsible for slavery. I get it. But we are personally responsible for how we treat people who are black, our brothers and sisters. We are. The wonderful thing about this lesson is it sets the stage for a tremendous transformation. Joseph becomes, uh, yeah, he's humiliated. He becomes humble. And he starts to realize, my brother's lives do matter. We need to be more humble, I think. My brothers and sisters who are black, their lives do matter. They are important. Joseph is the one ultimately who reconciles relationships. We white folks have the power to be able to reconcile relationships. We have that ability by sitting down and listening. and saying, your life does matter. So a young man, I was just, I was thrilled at, at PNC Bank. He was, uh, he was one of the people allowing people into the bank and letting people know, and he's wearing a mask. He had a Black Lives Matter uh, mask on. And I was really happy for the fact that my bank allowed him to wear that. And I came up and I said, you know what? Your life, young man, does matter to me. And I'm sorry if it sometimes felt like it hasn't. I hear you. That's what they need to hear. That's what Joseph's brothers needed to hear. Here's the amazing thing. Despite the self-importance, the arrogance, the tattletale crybaby that Joseph was, God still accomplishes some amazing things despite our evil, our arrogance, our foolishness. I believe that God can do spectacular things. If God can transform Joseph's life, as we'll see in the weeks to come, God can transform ours and bring reconciliation and peace to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for showing us these great stories about the, this divided family that you brought together through humility. Because yeah, there were some brothers that were being ignored and they were crying out, my life matters, they were crying out. And Joseph, the arrogant twit that he was, just said, no, but I'm, my life matters. I'm, I'm more important. But God, you touched him. You transformed him. You brought him to humility. And as such, in his humility, he was able to reconcile relationships with his brothers. We look forward to hearing that lesson in the weeks to come. Pray that you would Reconcile us to our brothers and sisters in Christ, our brothers and sisters in this world, whether it's in Christ or not, because you mean for us to love one another. And so God, bring us to humility, a time of humility. Help us to be a source of your reconciliation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ooh, that was heavier lesson than I truly expected it to be. But I hope you're blessed today. May God's blessing be upon you and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.